VMC Demo The actual demonstration of VMC and recovery in flight training more closely resembles static VMC determination in aircraft certification. For a demonstration that avoids the hazard of unintended contact with the ground, the pilot selects an altitude that will allow performance of the maneuver at least 3,000 feet AGL. The following description assumes a twin with non-counterrotating engines, where the left engine is critical. With the landing gear retracted and the flaps set to the takeoff position, the pilot slows the airplane to approximately 10 knots above VSSE or VYSE, whichever is higher, and trims for takeoff. For the remainder of the maneuver, the trim setting remains unaltered. The pilot selects an entry heading and sets high RPM on both propeller controls. Power on the left engine is throttled back to idle as the right engine power is advanced to the takeoff setting. The landing gear warning horn will sound as long as the throttle is retarded, however the pilot listens carefully for the stall warning horn or watches for the stall warning light. The left yawing and rolling moment of the asymmetrical thrust is counteracted primarily with right rudder. A bank angle of up to 5 degrees, a right bank in this case, may be established as appropriate for the airplane make and model. While maintaining entry heading, the pitch attitude is slowly increased to decelerate at a rate of 1 knot per second, no faster. As the airplane slows and control effectivity decays, the pilot counteracts the increasing yawing tendency with additional rudder pressure. Aileron displacement will also increase in order to maintain the established bank. An airspeed is soon reached where full right rudder travel and up to a 5 degrees right bank can no longer counteract the asymmetrical thrust, and the airplane will begin to yaw uncontrollably to the left. The moment the pilot first recognizes the uncontrollable yaw, or experiences any symptom associated with a stall, the pilot simultaneously retards the throttle for the operating engine to stop the yaw and lowers the pitch attitude to regain speed. Recovery is made to straight flight on the entry heading at VSSE or VYSE. The pilot increases power to the operating engine and demonstrates controlled flight before restoring symmetrical power. To keep the foregoing description simple, there were several important background details that were not covered. The rudder pressure during the demonstration can be quite high. During certification under Historical 14 CFR Part 23, Section 23.149 E, 150 pounds of force was permitted. Most twins will run out of rudder travel long before 150 pounds of pressure is required. Still, the rudder pressure used during any VMC demonstration may seem considerable. Maintaining altitude is not a criterion in accomplishing this maneuver. This is a demonstration of controllability, not performance. Many airplanes will lose, or gain, altitude during the demonstration. Remaining at or above a minimum of 3,000 feet AGL throughout the maneuver is considered to be effective risk mitigation of certain hazards. VMC Demo Stall Avoidance As discussed earlier, with normally aspirated engines, VMC decreases with altitude. Stalling speed, VS, however, remains the same. Except for a few models, Published VMC is almost always higher than versus at sea level there is usually a margin of several knots between VMC and VS, but the margin decreases with altitude, and at some altitude, VMC and VS are the same. Figure 13, 14 Should a stall occur while the airplane is under asymmetrical power, a spin entry is likely. The yawing moment induced from asymmetrical thrust is little different from that induced by full rudder in an intentional spin in the appropriate model of single-engine airplane. In this case, however, the airplane will depart controlled flight in the direction of the idle engine, not in the direction of applied rudder. Twins are not required to demonstrate recoveries from spins, and their spin recovery characteristics are generally very poor. Where VS is encountered before VMC, the departure from controlled flight might be quite sudden, with strong yawing and rolling tendencies to the inverted orientation and a spin entry. Therefore, during a VMC demonstration, if there are any symptoms of an impending stall such as a stall warning light or horn, airframe or elevator buffet, or sudden loss of control effectiveness, the pilot should terminate the maneuver immediately by reducing the angle of attack as the throttle is retarded and return the airplane to the entry airspeed. Note that noise within the flight deck may mask the sound of the stall warning horn. While the VMC demonstration shows the earliest onset of a loss of directional control when performed in accordance with the foregoing procedures, avoid a stalled condition. Avoid stalls with asymmetrical thrust, such that the VMC demonstration does not degrade into a single-engine stall. 
A VMC demonstration that is allowed to degrade into a single engine stall with high asymmetrical thrust may result in an unrecoverable loss of control and a fatal accident. End of page 13 to 26. An actual demonstration of VMC may not be possible under certain conditions of density altitude or with airplanes whose VMC is equal to or less than versus under those circumstances, as a training technique, a demonstration of VMC may safely be conducted by artificially limiting rudder travel to simulate maximum available rudder. A speed well above VS, approximately 20 knots, is recommended when limiting rudder travel. The rudder limiting technique avoids the hazards of spinning as a result of stalling with high asymmetrical power, yet is effective in demonstrating the loss of directional control. To reduce the risk of a loss of control, avoid performing any VMC demonstration from a high-pitch attitude with both engines operating and then reducing power on one engine. OEI Climb Performance Best OEI climb performance is obtained at VYSE with maximum available power and minimum drag. After the flaps and landing gear have been retracted and the propeller of the failed engine feathered, a key element in best climb performance is minimizing side slip. For any airplane, side slip can be confirmed through the use of a yaw string. A yaw string is a piece of string or yarn approximately 18 to 36 inches in length taped to the base of the windshield or to the nose near the windshield along the airplane centerline. In two-engine coordinated flight, the relative wind causes the string to align itself with the longitudinal axis of the airplane, and it positions itself straight up the center of the windshield. This is zero side slip. Experimentation with slips and skids vividly displays the location of the relative wind. A particular combination of aileron and rudder also establishes zero side slip during OEI flight. Adequate altitude, flying speed, and caution should be maintained if attempting these maneuvers. With a single-engine airplane or a multi-engine airplane with both engines operative, side slip is eliminated when the ball of the turn and bank instrument is centered. This is a condition of zero side slip and the airplane is presenting its smallest possible profile to the relative wind. As a result, drag is at its minimum. Pilots know this as coordinated flight. In a multi-engine airplane with an inoperative engine, the centered ball is no longer the indicator of zero side slip due to asymmetric thrust. In fact, there is no flight deck instrument that directly indicates conditions for zero side slip. In the absence of a yaw string, the pilot needs to place the airplane at a predetermined bank angle and ball position. Since the AFM slash POH performance charts for one engine in operative flight were determined at zero side slip, this technique should be used to obtain the charted OEI performance. There are two different control inputs that can be used to counteract the asymmetric thrust of a failed engine. One, yaw from the rudder. Two, the horizontal component of lift that results from bank with the ailerons. End of page 13 to 27. Used individually, neither is correct. Used together in the proper combination, zero side slip and best climb performance are achieved. Three different scenarios of airplane control inputs are presented below. The first two are not correct and can increase the risk of a loss of control. They are presented to illustrate the reasons for the zero side slip approach to best climb performance. 1. Engine in operative flight with wings level and ball centered requires large rudder input toward the operative engine. Figure 13, 15. The result is a moderate side slip toward the inoperative engine. Climb performance is reduced by the moderate side slip. With wings level, VMC is significantly higher than published as there is no horizontal component of lift available to help the rudder combat asymmetrical thrust. 2. Engine in operative flight using ailerons alone requires an 8 to 10 degrees bank angle toward the operative engine. Figure 13, 16. This assumes no rudder input, the ball is displaced well toward the operative engine, and climb performance is greatly reduced by the large side slip toward the operative engine. Due to the increased risk of loss of control, instructors should not normally demonstrate this. End of page 13 to 28. 3. Rudder and ailerons used together in the proper combination result in a bank of approximately 2 degrees toward the operative engine. The ball is displaced approximately one-third to one-half toward the operative engine. The result is zero side slip and maximum climb performance. Figure 13, 17. 
Any attitude other than zero side slip increases drag, decreasing performance. VMC under these circumstances is higher than published, as less than the 5 degrees bank certification limit is employed. When bank angle is plotted against climb performance for a hypothetical twin, zero side slip results in the best, however marginal, climb performance or the least rate of descent. Whether the airplane can climb depends on the weight of the airplane, density altitude, and pilot technique. If the pilot uses zero bank, all rudder to counteract yaw, climb performance degrades as a result of moderate side slip. Using bank angle alone, no rudder, severely degrades climb performance as a result of a large side slip. The precise condition of zero side slip, bank angle and ball position, varies slightly from model to model and with available power and airspeed. If the airplane is not equipped with counter-rotating propellers, it also varies slightly with the engine fail due to P-factor. The foregoing zero side slip recommendations apply to reciprocating engine multi-engine airplanes flown at VYSE with the inoperative engine feathered. The zero side slip ball position for straight flight is also the zero side slip position for turning flight. The actual bank angle for zero side slip varies among airplanes from 1 and 1 half to 2 and 1 half degrees. The position of the ball varies from 1 third to 1 half of a ball width from instrument center toward the operative engine. During certain flight training scenarios, pilots and instructors simulate propeller feathering. Zero thrust means the pilot sets power on one engine such that drag from its rotating propeller equals that of a stopped feathered propeller. With an engine set to zero thrust, or feathered, and the airplane slowed to VYSA, a climb with maximum power on the remaining engine reveals the precise bank angle and ball deflection required for zero side slip and best climb performance. Again, if a yaw string were present, it aligns itself vertically on the windshield as an indication of zero side slip. There are very minor changes from this attitude depending upon the engine failed, with non-counter-rotating propellers, power available, airspeed, and weight, but without more sensitive testing equipment, these changes are difficult to detect. The only significant difference would be the pitch attitude required to maintain VYSE under different density altitude, power available, and weight conditions. Low Altitude Engine Failure Scenarios in OEI flight at low altitudes and airspeeds such as the initial climb after takeoff, pilots should operate the airplane so as to guard against the three major accident factors, 1. Loss of directional control, 2. Loss of performance, and 3. Loss of flying speed. All have equal potential to be lethal. Loss of flying speed is not a factor, however, when the airplane is operated with due regard for directional control and performance. End of page 13 to 29. A takeoff or go around is the most critical time to suffer an engine failure. The airplane will be slow, close to the ground, and may even have landing gear and flaps extended. Altitude in time is minimal. Until feathered, the propeller of the failed engine is windmilling, producing a great deal of drag and yawing tendency. Airplane climb performance is marginal or even non existent, and obstructions may lie ahead. An emergency contingency plan and safety brief should be clearly understood well before the takeoff roll commences. An engine failure before a predetermined airspeed or point results in an aborted takeoff. An engine failure after a certain airspeed and point, with the gear up, and climb performance assured result in a continued takeoff. With loss of an engine, it is paramount to maintain airplane control and comply with the manufacturer's recommended emergency procedures. Complete failure of one engine shortly after takeoff can be broadly categorized into one of three following scenarios. Landing gear down. If the engine failure occurs prior to selecting the landing gear to the up position, figure 13, 18, keep the nose as straight as possible, close both throttles, adjust pitch attitude to maintain adequate airspeed, and descend to the runway. Concentrate on a normal landing and do not force the aircraft on the ground land on the remaining runway or overrun. Depending upon how quickly the pilot reacts to the sudden yaw, the airplane may run off the side of the runway by the time action is taken. There are really no other practical options. As discussed earlier, the chances of maintaining directional control while retracting the flaps, if extended, landing gear, feathering the propeller, and accelerating are minimal. On some airplanes with a single-engine-driven hydraulic pump, Failure of that engine means the only way to raise the landing gear is to allow the engine to windmill or to use a hand pump. This is not a viable alternative during takeoff. 
Landing gear control selected up, single engine climb performance inadequate. When operating near or above the single engine ceiling and an engine failure is experienced shortly after liftoff, a landing needs to be accomplished on whatever essentially lies ahead. Figure 13, 19. There is also the option of continuing ahead in a descent at VYSC with the remaining engine producing power, as long as the pilot is not tempted to remain airborne beyond the airplane's performance capability. Remaining airborne and bleeding off airspeed in a futile attempt to maintain altitude is almost invariably fatal. Landing under control is paramount. The greatest hazard in a single-engine takeoff is attempting to fly when it is not within the performance capability of the airplane to do so. An accident is inevitable. End of page 13 to 30. Analysis of engine failures on takeoff reveals a very high success rate of off-airport engine inoperative landings when the airplane is landed under control. Analysis also reveals a very high fatality rate in stall spin accidents when the pilot attempts flight beyond the performance capability of the airplane. As mentioned previously, if the airplane's landing gear retraction mechanism is dependent upon hydraulic pressure from a certain engine-driven pump, failure of that engine can mean a loss of hundreds of feet of altitude as the pilot either windmills the engine to provide hydraulic pressure to raise the gear or raises it manually with a backup pump. Landing gear control selected up. Single engine climb performance adequate. If the single engine rate of climb is adequate, the procedures for continued flight should be followed. Figure 13, 20. There are four areas of concern, control, configuration, climb, and checklist. Control. The first consideration following engine failure during takeoff is to maintain control of the airplane. Maintaining directional control with prompt and often aggressive rudder application and stopping the YAW is critical to the safety of flight. Ensure that airspeed stays above VMC. If the yaw cannot be controlled with full rudder applied, reducing thrust on the operative engine is the only alternative. Attempting to correct the roll with aileron without first applying rudder increases drag in adverse yaw and further degrades directional control. After rudder is applied to stop the yaw, a slight amount of aileron should be used to bank the airplane toward the operative engine. This is the most efficient way to control the aircraft, minimize drag, and gain the most performance. Control forces, particularly on the rudder, may be high. The pitch attitude for VYSE has to be lowered from that of VY. At least 5 degrees and a maximum of 10 degrees of bank toward the operative engine should be used initially to stop the yaw and maintain directional control. This initial bank input is held only momentarily, just long enough to establish or ensure directional control. Climb performance suffers when bank angles exceed approximately 2 or 3 degrees, but obtaining and maintaining VYSE and directional control are paramount. Trim should be adjusted to lower the control forces. Configuration the memory items from the engine failure after takeoff checklist should be promptly executed to configure the airplane for climb. Figure 13, 21. The specific procedures to follow are found in the AFM slash POH and checklist for the particular airplane. Most direct the pilot to assume VYSE, set takeoff power, retract the flaps and landing gear, identify, verify, and feather the failed engine. On some airplanes, the landing gear is to be retracted before the flaps. End of page 13 to 31. The identify step is for the pilot to initially identify the failed engine. Confirmation on the engine gauges may or may not be possible, depending upon the failure mode. Identification should be primarily through the control inputs required to maintain straight flight, not the engine gauges. The verify step directs the pilot to retard the throttle of the engine thought to have failed. No change in performance when the suspected throttle is retarded is verification that the correct engine has been identified as failed. The corresponding propeller control should be brought fully aft to feather the engine. Climb As soon as directional control is established and the airplane configured for climb, the bank angle should be reduced to that producing best climb performance. Without specific guidance for zero sideslip, a bank of 2 degrees and one third to one half ball deflection on the slip slash skid indicator toward the operative engine is suggested. VYSE is maintained with pitch control. As turning flight reduces climb performance, 
Climb should be made straight ahead or with shallow turns to avoid obstacles to an altitude of at least 400 feet AGL before attempting a return to the airport. Checklist Having accomplished the memory items from the engine failure after takeoff checklist, the printed copy should be reviewed as time permits. The securing failed engine checklist should then be accomplished. Figure 13, 22 Unless the pilot suspects an engine fire, the remaining items should be accomplished deliberately and without undue haste. Airplane control should never be sacrificed to execute the remaining checklists. The priority items have already been accomplished from memory. End of page 13 to 32. Other than closing the cowl flap of the failed engine, none of these items, if left undone, adversely affect airplane climb performance. There is a distinct possibility of actuating an incorrect switch or control if the procedure is rushed. The pilot should concentrate on flying the airplane and extracting maximum performance. If an ATC facility is available, an emergency should be declared. The memory items in the engine failure after takeoff checklist may be redundant with the airplane's existing configuration. For example, in the third takeoff scenario, the gear and flaps were assumed to already be retracted, yet the memory items included gear and flaps. This is not an oversight. The purpose of the memory items is to either initiate the appropriate action or to confirm that a condition exists. Action on each item may not be required in all cases. The memory items also apply to more than one circumstance. In an engine failure from a go-around, for example, the landing gear and flaps would likely be extended when the failure occurred. The three preceding takeoff scenarios all include the landing gear as a key element in the decision to land or continue. With the landing gear selector in the down position, for example, continued takeoff and climb is not recommended. This situation, however, is not justification to retract the landing gear the moment the airplane lifts off the surface on takeoff as a normal procedure. The landing gear should remain selected down as long as there is usable runway or overrun available to land on. The use of wing flaps for takeoff virtually eliminates the likelihood of a single engine climb until the flaps are retracted. There are two time-tested memory aids the pilot may find useful in dealing with engine-out scenarios. The first, dead foot, dead engine, is used to assist in identifying the failed engine. Depending on the failure mode, the pilot will not be able to consistently identify the failed engine in a timely manner from the engine gauges. In maintaining directional control, however, rudder pressure is exerted on the side, left or right, of the airplane with the operating engine. Thus, the dead foot is on the same side as the dead engine. Variations on this saying include idle foot idle engine and working foot working engine. The second memory aid has to do with climb performance. The phrase raise the dead is a reminder that the best climb performance is obtained with a very shallow bank, about 2 degrees toward the operating engine. Therefore, the inoperative, or dead engine should be raised with a very slight bank. Not all engine failures result in complete power loss. If there is a performance loss when the throttle of the affected engine is retarded, some power is still available. In this case, the pilot may consider allowing the engine to run until the airplane reaches a safe altitude and airspeed for single-engine flight. While shutdown of a malfunctioning engine may prevent additional damage to the engine in certain circumstances, shutting down an engine that can still produce partial power may increase risk for an accident. End of page 13 to 33. Engine failure during flight. Engine failures well above the ground are handled differently than those occurring at lower speeds and altitudes. Cruise airspeed allows better airplane control and altitude, which may permit time for a possible diagnosis and remedy of the failure. Maintaining airplane control, however, is still paramount. Airplanes have been lost at altitude due to apparent fixation on the engine problem to the detriment of flying the airplane. Not all engine failures or malfunctions are catastrophic in nature, catastrophic meaning a major mechanical failure that damages the engine and precludes further engine operation. Many cases of power loss are related to fuel starvation, where restoration of power may be made with the selection of another tank. An orderly inventory of gauges and switches may reveal the problem. Carburetor heat or alternate air can be selected. The affected engine may run smoothly on just one magneto or at a lower power setting. Altering the mixture may help. If fuel vapor formation is suspected, fuel boost pump operation may be used to eliminate flow and pressure fluctuations. 
Although it is a natural desire among pilots to save an ailing engine with a precautionary shutdown, the engine should be left running if there is any doubt as to needing it for further safe flight. Catastrophic failure accompanied by heavy vibration, smoke, blistering paint, or large trails of oil, on the other hand, indicate a critical situation. The affected engine should be feathered and the securing failed engine checklist completed. The pilot should divert to the nearest suitable airport and declare an emergency with ATC for priority handling. Fuel crossfeed is a method of getting fuel from a tank on one side of the airplane to an operating engine on the other. Crossfeed is used for extended single engine operation. If a suitable airport is close at hand, there is no need to consider crossfeed. If prolonged flight on a single engine is inevitable due to airport non availability, then crossfeed allows use of fuel that would otherwise be unavailable to the operating engine. It also permits the pilot to balance the fuel consumption to avoid an out of balance wing heaviness. The AFM slash POH procedures for crossfeed vary widely. Thorough fuel system knowledge is essential if crossfeed is to be conducted. Fuel selector positions and fuel boost pump usage for crossfeed differ greatly among multi engine airplanes. Prior to landing, crossfeed should be terminated and the operating engine returned to its main tank fuel supply. If the airplane is above its single engine absolute ceiling at the time of engine failure, it slowly loses altitude. The pilot should maintain VYSE to minimize the rate of altitude loss. This drift down rate is greatest immediately following the failure and decreases as the single engine ceiling is approached. Due to performance variations caused by engine and propeller wear, turbulence, and pilot technique, the airplane may not maintain altitude even at its published single-engine ceiling. Any further rate of sink, however, would likely be modest. An engine failure in a descent or other low-power setting can be deceiving. The dramatic yaw and performance loss is absent. At very low-power settings, the pilot may not even be aware of a failure. If a failure is suspected, the pilot should advance both engine mixtures, propellers, and throttles significantly to the takeoff settings if necessary to correctly identify the failed engine. The power on the operative engine can always be reduced later. Engine in operative approach and landing. The approach and landing with OEI is essentially the same as a two engine approach and landing. The traffic pattern should be flown at similar altitudes, airspeeds, and key positions as a two-engine approach. The differences are the reduced power available and the fact that the remaining thrust is asymmetrical. A higher-than-normal power setting is necessary on the operative engine. With adequate airspeed and performance, the landing gear can still be extended on the downwind leg. In which case it should be confirmed down no later than a beam the intended point of landing. Performance permitting, initial extension of wing flaps, typically 10 degrees, and a descent from pattern altitude can also be initiated on the downwind leg. The airspeed should be no slower than VYSE. The direction of the traffic pattern, and therefore the turns, is of no consequence as far as airplane controllability and performance are concerned. It is perfectly acceptable to make turns toward the failed engine. On the base leg, if performance is adequate, the flaps may be extended to an intermediate setting, typically 25 degrees. If the performance is inadequate, as measured by decay in airspeed or high sink rate, delay further flap extension until closer to the runway. VYSE is still the minimum airspeed to maintain. On final approach, a normal 3 degrees glide path to a landing is desirable. Visual approach slope indicator, VASI, or other vertical path lighting aids should be utilized if available. Slightly steeper approaches may be acceptable. However, a long, flat, low approach should be avoided. Large, sudden power applications or reductions should also be avoided. Maintain VYSE until the landing is assured, then slow to 1.3 VSO or the AFM slash POH recommended speed. The final flap setting may be delayed until the landing is assured or the airplane may be landed with partial flaps. End of page 13 to 34. The airplane should remain in trim throughout. The pilot should be prepared, however, for a rudder trim change as the power of the operating engine is reduced to idle in the roundout just prior to touchdown. With drag from only one windmilling propeller, the airplane tends to float more than on a two-engine approach. Precise airspeed control therefore is essential, especially when landing on a short, wet, and or slippery surface. Some pilots favor resetting the rudder trim to neutral on final and compensating for yaw by holding rudder pressure for the remainder of the approach. 
This eliminates the rudder trim change close to the ground as the throttle is closed during the round out for landing. This technique eliminates the need for groping for the rudder trim and manipulating it to neutral during final approach, which many pilots find to be highly distracting. AFM slash POH recommendations or personal preference should be used. A single engine go around on final approach may not be possible. As a practical matter in single engine approaches, once the airplane is on final approach with landing gear and flaps extended, it is committed to land on the intended runway, on another runway, a taxiway, or grassy infield. Most light twins do not have the performance to climb on one engine with landing gear and flaps extended. Considerable altitude is lost while maintaining VYSE and retracting landing gear and flaps. Losses of 500 feet or more are not unusual. If the landing gear has been lowered with an alternate means of extension, retraction may not be possible, virtually negating any climb capability. Multi-engine training considerations. Flight training in a multi-engine airplane can be safely accomplished if both the instructor and the learner consider the following factors. 1. The participants should conduct a pre-flight briefing of the objectives, maneuvers, expected learner actions, and completion standards before the flight begins. 2. A clear understanding exists as to how simulated emergencies will be introduced and what action the learner is expected to take. The introduction, practice, and testing of emergency procedures has always been a sensitive subject. Surprising a multi-engine learner with an emergency without a thorough briefing beforehand creates a hazardous condition. Simulated engine failures, for example, can very quickly become actual emergencies or lead to loss of the airplane when approached carelessly. Stallspin accidents in training for emergencies rival the number of stallspin accidents from actual emergencies. The training risk normally gets mitigated by a briefing. Pulling circuit breakers is not recommended for training purposes and can lead to a subsequent gear-up landing. Many normal, abnormal, and emergency procedures can be introduced and practiced in the airplane as it sits on the ground without the engines running. In this respect, the airplane is used as a procedures trainer. The value of this training may be substantial. The engines do not have to be operating for real learning to occur. Upon completion of a training session, care should be taken to restore items to their proper positions. Pilots who do not use a checklist effectively will be at a significant disadvantage in multi-engine airplanes. Use of the checklist is essential to safe operation of airplanes, and it is risky to conduct a flight without one. The manufacturer's checklist or an aftermarket checklist that conforms to the manufacturer's procedures for the specific make, model, and model year may be used. If there is a procedural discrepancy between the checklist and the AFM slash POH, then the AFM slash POH always takes precedence. Certain immediate action items, such as a response to an engine failure in a critical phase of flight, are best committed to memory. After they are accomplished, and as workload permits, the pilot can compare the action taken with a checklist. Simulated engine failures during the takeoff ground roll may be accomplished with the mixture control. The simulated failure should be introduced at a speed no greater than 50% of VMC. If a learner does not react promptly by retarding both throttles, the instructor can always pull the other mixture. The FAA recommends that all in-flight simulated engine failures below 3,000 feet AGL be introduced with a smooth reduction of the throttle. Thus, the engine is kept running and is available for instant use, if necessary. Smooth throttle reduction avoids abusing the engine and possibly causing damage. Simulation of in-flight engine failures below VSSE introduces a very high and unnecessary training risk. If the engines are equipped with dynamic crankshaft counterweights, it is essential to make throttle reductions for simulated failures smoothly. Other areas leading to dynamic counterweight damage include high RPM and low manifold pressure combinations, overboosting, and propeller feathering. Severe damage or repetitive abuse to counterweights will eventually lead to engine failure. Dynamic counterweights are found on larger, more complex engines, instructors may check with maintenance personnel or the engine manufacturer to determine if their airplane engines are so equipped. End of page 13 to 35. When an instructor simulates an engine failure, the learner should respond with the appropriate memory items and retard the appropriate propeller control toward the feather position. Assuming zero thrust will be set, 
the instructor promptly moves the propeller control forward and sets the appropriate manifold pressure and RPM. It is vital that the learner be kept informed of the instructor's intentions. At this point the instructor may say words to the effect, I have the right engine, you have the left. I have set zero thrust and the right engine is simulated feathered. Any ambiguity as to who is operating what systems or controls increases the likelihood of an unintended outcome. Following a simulated engine failure, the instructor cares for the failed engine just as the learner cares for the operative engine. If zero thrust is set to simulate a feathered propeller, the cowl flap is normally closed and the mixture leaned. An occasional clearing of the engine is also desirable. If possible, avoid high power applications immediately following a prolonged cooldown at a zero thrust power setting. A competent flight instructor teaches the multi-engine learner about the critical importance of feathering the propeller in a timely manner should an actual engine failure situation ever be encountered. A windmilling propeller, in many cases, has given the improperly trained multi-engine pilot the mistaken perception that the engine is still developing useful thrust, resulting in a psychological reluctance to feather, as feathering results in cessation of propeller rotation. The flight instructor should spend ample time demonstrating the difference in the performance capabilities of the airplane with a simulated feathered propeller, zero thrust, as opposed to a windmilling propeller. Actual and safe propeller feathering for training is performed at altitudes and positions where safe landings on established airports may be readily accomplished if the propeller will not unfeather. Plan on feathering and restart to be completed no lower than 3,000 feet AGL. At certain elevations and with many popular multi-engine training airplanes, this may be above the single-engine service ceiling, and level flight will not be possible. Repeated feathering and unfeathering is hard on the engine and airframe, and is done as necessary to ensure adequate training. The FAA's Airman Certification Standards for a Multi-Engine Class Rating contains a task for feathering and unfeathering of one propeller during flight in airplanes in which it is safe to do so. While much of this chapter has been devoted to the unique flight characteristics of a multi-engine airplane with one engine inoperative, the modern well-maintained reciprocating engine is remarkably reliable. When training in an airplane, initiation of a simulated engine inoperative emergency at low altitude normally occurs at a minimum of 400 feet AGL to mitigate the risk involved and only after the learner has successfully mastered engine inoperative procedures at higher altitudes. Initiating a simulated low-altitude engine inoperative emergency in the airplane at extremely low altitude, immediately after liftoff, or below VSSE creates a situation where there are non-existent safety margins. For training in maneuvers that would be hazardous in flight, or for initial and recurrent qualification in an advanced multi-engine airplane, consider a simulator training center or manufacturer's training course. Comprehensive training manuals and classroom instruction are available along with system training aids, audio slash visuals, and flight training devices and simulators. Training under a wide variety of environmental and aircraft conditions is available through simulation. Emergency procedures that would be either dangerous or impossible to accomplish in an airplane can be done safely and effectively in a flight training device or simulator. The flight training device or simulator need not necessarily duplicate the specific make and model of airplane to be useful. Highly effective instruction can be obtained in training devices for other makes and models as well as generic training devices. The majority of multi-engine training is conducted in 4-6 to six place airplanes at weights significantly less than maximum. Single-engine performance, particularly, at low-density altitudes, may be deceptively good. To experience the performance expected at higher weights, altitudes and temperatures, the instructor may occasionally artificially limit the amount of manifold pressure available on the operative engine. Airport operations above the single-engine ceiling can also be simulated in this matter. Avoid loading the airplane with passengers to practice emergencies at maximum takeoff weight since this practice creates an unnecessary training hazard. The use of the touch-and-go landing and takeoff in multi-engine flight training has always been somewhat controversial. The value of the learning experience may be offset by the hazards of reconfiguring the airplane for takeoff in extremely limited time as well as the loss of the follow-through ordinarily experienced in a full-stop landing. Touch-and-goes are not recommended during initial aircraft familiarization in multi-engine airplanes. If touch-and-goes are to be performed at all, the learner and instructor responsibilities should be carefully briefed prior to each flight. Following touchdown, the learner will ordinarily maintain directional control while keeping the left hand on the yoke and the right hand on the throttles. The instructor resets the flaps and trim and announces when the airplane has been reconfigured. 
The multi-engine airplane uses considerably more runway to perform a touch-and-go than a single-engine airplane. A full-stop taxi back landing is preferable during initial familiarization. Solo touch and goes in twins are strongly discouraged. End of page 13 to 36. Chapter Summary Small multi-engine airplanes handle much like single-engine airplanes as long as both engines are functioning normally. A competent multi-engine pilot, however, acquires the additional knowledge, risk mitigation strategies, and practical skills required to fly a multi-engine airplane in case a loss of thrust from one engine actually occurs. In that case, the pilot will be able to take appropriate action leading to a safe outcome. Much of this chapter discussed loss of directional control. How to obtain the best performance with an inoperative engine was also described in detail. These two considerations correspond to the red radial line, VMC, and the blue radial line, VYSA, on the airspeed indicator. The actions a pilot takes when dealing with stalls, VMC, or best performance vary greatly. Understanding these concepts, knowing how to mitigate the risks, and possessing the skills to handle an engine failure in a variety of situations, allows a pilot to enjoy the increased performance and safety provided when flying a multi-engine airplane. End of page 13 to 37. End of chapter 13. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Chapter 14 is coming soon.